Thank you very much for everybody uh, to come to join us on this online debate or discussion or, uh, let me see, dialogue. And uh, this a uh, you know, very typical topic, uh, online, you know, AI at work, particular chat GPT, which is really, really coming to everybody's, uh, you know, social media or work, um, particularly for people in education, in the business. I think it's really, really uh, coming on like, like a storm. And the aim of this um, event is actually not for us to share uh, the knowledge, how to use it with you, but it's more like, okay, we are all new to this new AI chatbot tool and how we can collaborate, how we can collectively uh, to sh uh, share, think about the two, think about the potential use of the two and also think about, okay, the challenges and recommendations. So it's going to be a collective effort. If you don't know me, my name is Na, and I work at Trinity Business School, Trinity College Dublin, as a social professor in HRM. Today, we have a line of experts, and I would like to share, you know, our experience with you. And more importantly, we also, you know, would like to hear from you, you know, uh, your experience, your views, and your opinions about the AI at work on this topic. So I'm going to share the slides. Okay, so, sorry. let's go forward. Maybe I took too much. So this is about online dialogue discussion. Again, everybody welcome. And it's organized by my colleagues at, uh, in Trinity. And then first of all, I will do hello and welcome again. Uh, if you've just joined us and uh, you are very welcome to this online uh, discussion yeah, at work. And I, you know, sorry, uh, you know, I did a preliminary analysis of the people who are you are from. So a uh, glad to see this uh, attract so much interest from all of you. So thank you again for joining us. And then I'm going to introduce in this next hour, what we're going to do. So the first one, we're going to kick off with some um, expert uh, ex uh, comments, you know, from Declan, from Adapt Center, which is AI based research center. Uh, Mary uh, from CIPD talk about how that uh, you know HR can cope with these changes, and we have Dave from Trinity Business School, my dear colleague, and then going to share okay about the research and practice. After that, we're going into breakout rooms, have a discussion. You will be facilitated by a uh, you know over a, a, a panel, and then taking some notes. After that, we come out the breakout room to the main room and share your insights. Finally, we wrap up. And just before we go to the experts' comments, I would like to share a little bit about this too, because in the pre-survey, pre-event survey, I hear, you know, there are majority of people talk about, actually, I heard about it, but never use it. Or some people actually start to use it at work. So to make sure that we are all on the same page, just a little bit background about AI at work, particular ChatGPT. And if the data is from their website. So basically it's very popular. Since it was launched in November, uh, at the end of November, actually in five days, they reached out to 1 million of users, people signed up and tried it out. And two months later, um, I think they got um, 30 million people, I think. And then in total in January, uh, you know, two, yeah, two months, they got 100 million people. And then in January, they have 30 million daily individual active users, you know, daily. So face this big storm from ChatGPT, of course, there's a lot of things, you know, appeared in the media. And they, you know, comment on this best AI chatbot and really impressively detailed human lack. On the other hand, there are also some concerns how this AI, you know, um, uh, hijacks the democracy and how this, you know, you can, from the title, you can see actually it's also has a bad, uh, you know, has a negative side of that. In terms of how it works, I will leave that to Declan, but I would like to give you some examples. And using this as to all from internet, so people for technical solutions, you know, coding or project management, and also sometimes people using content. So here I use uh, John Ryan, the CEO of Healthy Place to Work, uh, on his LinkedIn post about the jokes. On the left hand side, you can see they can help you to add, you know, uh, write up the blogs and content edit. 
And also there are some uses, you know, from the recent post on LinkedIn again, you know, how we can use the chat GPT in HR, particular for the recruitment. For example, writing job description, write out outreach email to your candidates. And if you receive a CV or something, they can develop a summary. So this is a, what we have, you know, give you some example. Personally, I use it for, you know, scheduling in my meetings, everything. So this is a kind of a really nutshell uh, view about what ChatGPT is and how, uh, how it works. Without further ado, I'm going to move to the panel. So I will let panel members to introduce yourself to, the, uh, to our group and also focus on the topic. Oh, more AI, actually. I will introduce this later is that uh, Harvard Business Review and the recent news is that the AI ChatGPT pass MBA exam. So what's next? Don't worry, that's a challenge for us educators. So if you're from the business, it's not a big deal. <laughs> Pass exam, I'm joking. Okay, so how AI is shaping our work from Declan at the Adapt Center. I'm gonna to move to Declan. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> so um, hi everyone, my name is Declan McKibben. And uh, as I'm introducing myself, I shall share my screen hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. So, can you see that? It should be loading. Yeah. Yeah, we can see it, Declan. Thank you. Uh, okay, so so I'm the executive director with the Adapt Research Centre, and I'm uh, specifically responsible for commercialization of artificial intelligence research and uh, working with industry and also spin out company formation. So I'm delighted to join uh, the team here today to share some of my uh, insights and experiences around really this sort of class of generative AI. Um, so ADAPT is a Science Foundation Ireland funded research centre and we have a, 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 our, our vision towards 2030 is that we're really driving the, the next generation of proactive and scalable and integrated AI um, driven digital media or digital content technology and it's about empowering individuals and enterprises and society to in, engage digitally sometimes immersively uh, with each other or just with uh, artificial intelligence agents but it's all it's important that this is done with control inclusion and accountability so we talk about trust and standards and ethics and um, uh, uh, scrutability the ability to actually direct how this technology supports us so ADAPT is a funded by Science Foundation Ireland. We're headquartered uh, here in Trinity and we are active across eight universities. We're focused on um, human centric AI, which really means anything to do with digital content that's about a human or for a human. So sensing a human, you know, using um, uh, uh, moves, uh, uh, sorry, uh, posture, position, actions the language that they create, how they speak outside of what they're saying linguistically, but their tone of voice, their emotion, um, images and video, and also increasingly how they will uh, interact immersively in, a, in the metaverse, for example, as a research focus for us. Um, uh, and we're also concerned with interacting with people through dialogue systems. Um, the way we organize our research, therefore, is that the digitally enhanced engagement research strand up the top is all about the person. So it's understanding the human in the loop. Uh, digital content transformation is the one on the left there, the blue one. And it's very much interested in the algorithmic focus and the signal processing. So whether you're talking about speech technology or language or machine translation or analyzing images or labeling um, medical scans, for example, this is really about applying algorithmic type technology and signal processing technology to different kinds of media. And it's important to have that capability, both when we're sensing uh, what uh, a human needs, but also being able to kind of generate interactions that are appropriate for that context, perhaps, perhaps in the form of a dialogue system or an next best offer or a recommended product, for example. Um, the last one there is probably the most important and it's called transparent digital governance. So this is really, you know, the rule of the game. This is where we ensure that these technology, be it how we use data or how we apply artificial intelligence, that it's trustworthy. And it's only by something being tr trustworthy that we can hope that the public or other communities of users have trust in it. So interesting things in here are really around influencing policy at a national and EU level, influencing standards uh, for how we describe and use data, um, and also um, how regulations can be applied. 
So we work with industry. So my responsibility is to work with industry. So you can see some of the brands that we work with there. And they're all interested in getting access to uh, the latest and greatest research, obviously accessing talent, but sometimes accessing new ideas in the university. Um, what I often say, I'll just skip that slide perhaps uh, and go straight to this one. You know, when we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, it's often uh, to automate or to augment human tasks. So whether that's the human task of learning to improve it, whether it's reading, you know, uh, reading documents, you know, we, we, we won't have time. Nobody can ever hope to watch all the YouTube videos or to read all the books or papers that are published. But we can have artificial intelligence agents parsing those um, media for us and providing, for example, summaries or uh, identifying, you know, kind of key features in there that we need should be attentive to. And then we can double click and have a look at those. Um, also, the use of artificial intelligence to listen to content, to be able to understand our speech. So we're all familiar with many people, especially younger people, talking to their phones. So ASR or automatic speech recognition is an artificial intelligence technology. It's based on, you know, um, audio processing and signal processing and then applying things like language models, which are the heart of ChatGPT, to turn that into um, a transcript of what's been spoken about and then it can be subject to an analyzing it and so on. Uh, artificial intelligence also helps us speak. So through um, speech agents and synthesizers, whether it's Alexa talking to us or whether it's a, an eyes busy, hands busy um, screen reader on your phone or whether it's a, a podcast that you're listening to. Often it's, a, it's artificial intelligence that has generated these. Uh, translation and localization is a big part of what we do in the ADAPT Center. So taking one language and translating it to another. And it's actually the research that enables that is also the research that enables ChatGPT. And then, uh, you know, one, one of the last human senses that, that can be augmented or automated with um, artificial intelligence is the ability to see, so vision. And we have a few startups here, actually. One is called Arama, which is um, being able to have a very high spec camera looking at a football game and being able to automatically detect the salient features within that. Where should we focus the camera? Uh, and you're looking at, you know, tracking the ball, of course, but you're also looking at where the players are looking uh, or where the crowd is directing their attention to. So really interesting research. Obvious applications of this vision technology would be in a health context to, um, you know, kind of analyze medical uh, imaging or uh, the kind of the posture or the gait of a patient, for example, or in an agricultural context to be able to look at um, remote sensing from satellite or drone imagery and being able to make yield predictions and so on. So these are the kinds of things that companies come to us about and that we collaborate with companies on. It's taking uh, artificial intelligence and um, deep tech affordances and being able then to apply them in a context that creates value for industry or for society. So um, uh, I thought I'd add in a couple of fintech uh, examples here. So we've worked with Deutsche Bank um, to analyze unstructured news sources like news uh, like LexisNexis or um, Google News and uh, other sources of insight for that. No human could help could could ever uh, stay up to speed on all of the content they have to read. But we were able to detect key insights there that would allow them, their librarians and their knowledge curators, to detect emerging trends or changes that are relevant to include in their internal knowledge bases. Uh, with Munich Re, which is a, uh, an insurance organization, we were helping them extract uh, insights from emails in order to speed up the underwriting process and reduce the amount of content. Uh, you can imagine this in an e-discovery context as well. It makes people more productive by having an agent that helps you discover uh, and retrieve those relevant uh, documents. Um, and then finally, we, we did an absenteeism project again for an insurance organization uh, and really understanding the dynamics behind um, absence from work and then being able to uh, direct a uh, you know, an expert human to then intervene appropriately in the cases where they would have the best opportunity of reducing or impacting positively that absenteeism. So they're just some of the kind of ways that industry is using um, uh, using artificial intelligence and the chat GPT, of course, is the one that's captured the imagination right now because it, it feels almost, almost magical. And I guess we'll get into that a little bit later, exactly what's under the hood and what its limitations uh, might be. So I think that's all I wanted to do uh, today, Na, just to share um, a little bit about ADAPT and how uh, 
ordinary organizations are using uh, AI in their businesses today. Perfect. Thank you very much, Declan. First of all, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. I also put a Menti, uh, meter, uh, Menti uh, link there. If you'd like to share with us your experience with um, chat, uh, chat GPT, please uh, feel free to do, uh, to do that. And then in terms of that, so how AI, uh, is, you know, this chatbot is working before you leave Declan, you know, you talk about those examples, very clear examples. Can you tell us that you know, when they use the AI at work, do they use the existing AI algorithms from outside the company or do they just using, you know, they develop the algorithms or, uh, you know, uh, AI tool based on the existing company's data? Sure. Okay, so it depends on the, the scale of the organization and the extent to which they can resource up an internal artificial intelligence or data science capability. Um, you know, some huge multinational organizations will have dedicated um, R and D teams or pure research teams that will support perhaps product development or internal innovation programs, and they recruit heavily from universities. So it's it's okay. you know there's, there's many professors working in there. Those organisations will either build their own technology stack or they'll use a plethora of open source technology that enables this. Python is a key kind of scripting language that has really tons of resources for it. Um, and then there will be specific um, development environments depending on the technology development preferences of the organization, you know, whether you're using a Microsoft Visual Studio and then the various kind of tooling that supports that. Um, it like so it really it depends on the scale it's of the, the organization. It's a combination. Okay, thank yeah, you very much. And, and if you look if you but if you look nowadays like Azure and um, AWS from Amazon, you know, they have um obviously cloud-based computing environments and collaborative environments, but they also have a full gamut of um, AI tools that can be easily harnessed uh, by perhaps people that don't have very kind of, you know, deep data science capabilities, but have perhaps better business skills. So this is part of a low code way of making uh, these kind of capabilities more accessible to, um, to people within uh, all sorts of enterprises. Thank you so much. So that's actually, uh, you know, a nice. Thank you very much. So that means that as a company, you can, you know, develop or you can actually uh, rent, you know, from Amazon or you can actually collect. It seems there, uh, you know, a range of free. And that's really uh, nicely connected to the next speaker, Mary, that if employees are using AI tools from outside the company or training the models using the data public available, or, you know, uh, this is one, how HR can manage employees using AI, you know, at their work. The other uh, aspect, I suppose, is how HR can adopt AI to make uh, HR's work better. So, hand over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, Nat, and great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And I'm Mary Connaughton, and I'm the director of CIPD in Ireland. So we are the professional body for human resources and people development. So it's great to be here talking about this exciting topic. And um, thanks, Declan, for your input. I think certainly as we look at it, and I'm not a techie, so um, I come at it from a, from a, a more practical perspective. Certainly when we look at it, we can see that um, the implementation of AI is, is definitely changing jobs, changing roles. I think what we're seeing with um, ChatGBT is its capacity to not just impact um, so much on what the technical side of how business is run in terms of the um, in terms of the infrastructure and the technology, but now it is about people in other types of jobs can now say, well, how can we take that output and how can we use that? And often when you come to that, there isn't a process or a tool for managing that. So it can be individuals trying to take advantage of that. And, and I suppose the question then it says for um, you know, human resources, how do we manage in that environment? What does it mean for productivity and performance? Do we have to step back and say, let's look at what productivity and performance look like? Because if you're expecting somebody to do a piece of work that was going to take them a day and they were getting it done in an hour, how do we understand what that performance now should look like? How can we put in the right checks and measures to make sure the right performance um, is reached? And, and that brings a bigger question about what are we rewarding? So if people are really performing highly because they have technology delivering data and results to them, but are we rewarding the um, software that's been produced and the um, technology stack? Or are we actually rewarding behavior that people are doing? 
Um, I think listening to, to, to Declan, it's very clear how many of the examples draw on masses of data. And that's, I think, the real power of this, is its capacity to bring in data. When it comes to people, we don't have that level of data. We don't have all that um, sophisticated data within an organization from a human resource perspective. And um, so it's harder to have that breadth of data. And also there's either protection around some of that data and, and, and gaps in that data. Um, so we have to be much more conscious of that. And you showed an example earlier of, of writing a job description. But in reality, when we want a job description, we want it to reflect the culture. So currently, Chat, Chat GPT will give you a job description, but we want it in practice to be more about the culture of the organization, the values of the organization, and all that to come through. And that's not necessarily what you'll get from a generic um, GPT um, model, but when you hear of what the technology companies are doing, they may have the infrastructure, the expertise and the resources to be able to do it. But for most organizations out there, it's not within their reach. And um, we also know that, and, and it says it, if you uh, log into GPT and talks about the risks of it, it calls out itself that this is biased. It doesn't give you unbiased information. And at one level you read about it, maybe it'll help us make um, you know, less discriminatory decisions. But because it's pulling together um, tons of data that's already there, and that discrimination and that bias may already be in that data, we've no guarantee that it actually is unbiased in what it's presenting. Um, and the other question I think we have from people management resource too is who owns the data? Who's the source of it? How if I present something and that I have taken from artificial intelligence, unless it's within my company boundaries, who actually owns that and where's the risk? And I know Dave is going to, to touch on um, governance. And then I thought, well, accuracy is an important aspect of it too. So I looked in, uh, I went in and I said, okay, um, you know, there's a new work-life balance bill in Ireland. What are the key points of it? Like summarize, give me the key points. And it came back and it talked about flexible working and it talked about carers and, and parents leave and, and supporting them. But it totally neglected things like medical care leave, totally ne neglected domestic abuse leave, the right to remote working, all things that have been being debated and discussed and are to into that legislation. So just because you can find an answer doesn't mean you're getting good information. And I suppose trying to make sure um, that that information is used in the right way in an organization is going to be challenging. We're very early days, I think, from a practitioner perspective in implementing this. We have a lot of learning and experimenting to do. But I think the danger is jumping in as the, the, the shiny new toy and thinking it has all the answers, whereas it hasn't. And we really will have to build up um, what can work right. And I'm looking forward to hearing the, the, the stories that uh, people with us today have. Thank you very much, Mary. That's really critical questions, right? You know, who owns the data? You know, who? You know, are we rewarding? Uh, are we managing uh, people's performance or um, the, the you know AI's performance? That's really interesting. Dave. Uh, before I go to you, I would like to you know again share some kind of a debate, leave you the biggest uh, questions. As you can see from Harvard Business Review, there you know positive side on the left hand side, ChatGPT uh, AI disrupts uh, industries, TP point for AI, you know uh, ChatGPT, and then the recent one actually talk about AI is getting good, but still cannot replace human curiosity. I love the quotes from the uh, uh, Wharton uh, Business School, uh, their daily saying that actually this is two authors. So the business that understand the significance of this change and act on it first will be at considerable advantage. And then the next one is really interesting. We are not going to get the toothpaste back into the tube. So what's next for us? And then actually I'm going to move to Dave. So what do you think about how we bridge research and practice? Thanks so much, Na. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to join the discussion today and, and uh, really interested to hear your thoughts and, and learned a lot already from, from Declan and Mary. And, and uh, um, now you, you can leave that slide up now if you want to. Um, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So uh, my name is Dave, Dave Collings, uh, as Na said, and, and I'm certainly not an expert in generative IT, but I have been working in the, the area of the future of work for the last number of years. And, and in that space, we've really been thinking about how technology is in, impacting on work and what it means for employees and organizations. 
I, and I think to me, despite all the hype about, uh, you know, chat GPT and other generative uh, AI uh, uh, right at the moment, my sense is this is just another example of how technology is, is augmenting work. Uh, and Declan alluded to that in his comments. Uh, and, and I think when we think of um, the opportunities for work and, and, and also the risks for work and employment, I think this is part of a bigger picture and a bigger story about the impacts of, of, of technology on work. You know, think back to, you know, three years ago and the world we were in, and, and then the impact of the pandemic on the digitization of so many different sectors and industries. You know, when was the last time most of us were in, were in a bank branch, for example, a sector that has completely digitized and transformed itself in a very short period of time? Look at the shift in retail towards online shopping, where we've retailers like Primark, who, who said they would never go into the digital space uh, now thinking about it and moving towards uh, online shopping as, as a tool. So, so it's another an example of, of, of trends that have impacted on work and are likely to continue to do so. Um, I, and Declan kind of pointed to it, it really did the, the potential in the workplace of, of tools like ChatGPT is really about automating or augmenting human tasks and organizations. So, you know, as I said, I'm no expert, but some of the research that I've been doing over the last little while points to examples like Microsoft's GitHub tool, which claims to generate up to 40% of the code that software developers who use it, uh, um, the output that, that they develop. And I think what that does is it kind of kickstarts the process for those software developers and some of the folks who are working with it say it greatly helps with creativity in terms of suggesting ideas that they may not otherwise come up with. Or, or in, other, in other areas, routine tasks that take a lot of time to set up can it be easily done through, through tools like, like Chat GPT. Um, and really from an organizational point of view, the, the challenge then becomes, how do I think about the sustainability of jobs and work in our organization? And how do I understand how tools like, like Chat GPT impact on the future of jobs and work. Uh, so for example, some of the organizations we're working with in a pre-chat uh, GPT world, uh, were certainly looking at how technology was likely to augment work in their organizations. And one particular insurance organization, for example, their research suggested that 15% of jobs will be eliminated in the next five years because of technology, and 50% of jobs will be augmented. So that created a, a question for them, how do we reskill and upskill those employees to ensure that we can create sustainable careers for our organizations. So the question then becomes, what are the skills and capabilities that employees currently have? What are the skills and capabilities they will need as this technology comes into the workplace? So for example, uh, in, in, in uh, the software world, this may, uh, tools like this may do some of the low level uh, software writing code freeing up our software engineers to write higher, higher level code and, and to write um, and to do the debugging and the testing and all that stuff that comes with it. Because as Declan alluded to, this, this technology isn't perfect. So we need to think about the skills we need to validate the, the output from tools like this. We need to think about how we can ask those right questions about the trust and the reliability of the data, validate it. So what are the critical skills that our employees need as their work becomes augmented by tools like ChatGPT? And how do we understand what the skills gap between what our employees currently have and what they currently, uh, or what they will need in the future as these tools become more mainstream are? Mary touched on the question of data and, and I'm currently involved in a, a project right now with, with Skillnet, Ireland, where we're looking at skills-based approaches to HR. And a big part of that project is thinking about questions like this in terms of the skills and capabilities we have and we need and ensuring we close that gap. And the biggest challenge for organizations is really kind of uh, validating the skills base that people have. Uh, and tools like ChatGPT might, might provide some help as we do try and um, infer the skills that people have from, from the work they do, validate the skills they have through different tasks and the like. Um, the second question I have there is, are current HR policies fit for purpose? And, and Mary alluded to a couple of these questions in terms of, of productivity and measurement and the like. But, but you know, certainly one that, the, that, the, um, that comes up regularly in the context of, two, of, of generative uh, AI is around IP and copyright questions. So some of the providers in the US, for example, would, would 
uh, talk to fair usage policies and say that they're using the data that they're drawing down kind of under the fair usage policies. But certainly this is an area where we need to be very careful about in our organizations. And we really need to be thoughtful about how we inform our employees about the risks they take when they use some of these tools. Uh, their obligations in terms of verifying questions around copyright and IP, because if these materials are passed on to our clients, where does the liability lie, lie in terms of any issues that emerge, for example? Um, you know, uh, Declan alluded to the fact that, you know, the, the data that are generated from these systems are, are, are not perfect and they can be misleading, unintentionally misleading, or they can be just, just pure, purely fake. Uh, an example of a tool that Meta launched called Galactic was a model that claimed to be trained on 48 million sci scientific articles and claimed to summarize that science, that scientific knowledge to solve maths problems and write code. Uh, Meta had to take that product down after three days when the scientific community pushed back on the accuracy of the claims that, of the results it was generating and said that in many instances it was misconstruing facts uh, fr from um, the um, the articles that it had re reviewed uh, and producing misleading uh, insights for those that were using it. So one of the challenges is, you know, there is no uh, real truth or single truth out there, which again is linked to this question about misinformation or toxic data uh, when these tools get into the wrong hands and can be used to influence in the wrong way. Uh, so um, I, I, I saw one quote in, in the FT last week that described uh, you know, these generative AI programs as brilliant but brainless mimics, really reflecting the fact that there aren't those kind of sophisticated checks or balances in most of the systems they use. And questions around real reliability are really important as we move forward with, with um, tools like this. Again, coming back to questions around what skills do our employees need to validate the information they're getting from it? How do we ensure that they are using these tools effectively to um, augment the work they're using, uh, they're doing in organizations and to bring positive benefit to the work rather than leading us down some of these, these paths which may be uh, less positive for the organization or the individual concerned. Uh, I'm gonna stop there now, but there are certainly some of the issues that I think are important for us to think about as we, as we think about these tools. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dave. I know that after hearing all of what we have said, the panel has said, I'm sure that you are ready to say something. So next, I'm going to move uh, to the uh, breakout discussion. Again, it's open discussion. I know a lot of people probably, uh, you know, at work, I, you know, feel free to, um, uh, op you know, open your camera and turn on your camera. So the two questions we're going to talk about in the breakout room is, are what are the challenges if you have employees use AI at work? And what are your recommendations to organization or HR as all the risks that uh, uh, Mary and Dave talk about and how HR could cope with these challenges? OK, so I'm going to stop here. And what we do, we're going to share. We're going to share uh, the insights on the link. And let me see. So I will put this link into the chat box. So everybody. But, and you will be led by, uh, you will be led by a facilitator. And yeah, please introduce yourself. You, you know me because time is limited. <laughs> limited. I probably won't be able to introduce the panel, but I put in the chat box, and that's the padlet. If you want your group want to share some insights and give you ten minutes, uh, maybe uh, twelve minutes, and talk about these challenges, recommendations, and then come back. We share uh, your insights. I'm going to. Open